Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of the School of Resistance, a live stream format that invites experts and change around the world to discuss valuable alternatives for the future and to create a blueprint for politics of resistance. This project is a collaboration between Entegent, IAPM, Akademie der Künste, Kulturstiftung des Bundes and HowlRound Theatre Commons. Other partners include European Alternatives, European Democracy Lab, Medico International and Merbe Verlag. Today's episode is called Politics of Interdependence. What would a truly caring world look like? During the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the consequences of the cuttings in the care and health systems in the countries got visible. The unequal access, the underestimation of the, works, uh, of the sector's work, of the workers themselves got visible and even led to decision over lives. Neoliberalism taught us to be self-sufficient individuals and COVID-19 is teaching us that we are not, that we depend on each other locally and internationally. Therefore, I'm very happy and honored to introduce you to our speakers of tonight to talk about a politic of, uh, of interdependence and uh, a truly caring world. I start to welcome Edna Bonhomme. She is a writer, historian of science and interdisciplinary artist. She holds a PhD in the history of science from Princeton University and a master's in health and public health from Columbia University. As a researcher, Edna's work interrogates the archaeology of postcolonial science, embodiment, surveillance, and the history of epidemics. Furthermore, I want to welcome Anne Jung. She is a political scientist and calling for global health care. She's head of the communication department of the human rights organization Medico International and has worked for many years as a global health officer at the Sociomedical Development. Medico promotes the human right to the best possible access to health. Uh, furthermore, announced was Lynn Siegel, um, who is part of the Care Collective and co-author of the Care Manifesto. Unfortunately, she is ill and we are hoping that one of her colleagues of the Care Collective can still join us. Um, we're not sure about it, but uh, we're crossing the fingers that it will still work out. Last but not least, my name is Carmen Hornbostel. I'm dramaturg at Antigent. And before we start the conversation, I would like to remind our audience that there's a possibility to engage in the conversation by asking questions. If you're watching live, uh, you can send us your question either emailing to School of Resistance at Antigent.be or by commenting on the live streams on the Facebook pages of Antigent or IAPM or even via Twitter uh, with the hashtag School of Resistance. So I actually wanted to start the conversation by getting a definition, a clearer insight to what actually is care and what we all have to redefine in there. Um, I hope that we still will have the answer later, but we see in the pandemic, we've seen words like system relevant work and suddenly uh, care work that we have never really seen in our society that was kind of done in the background uh, came up and the discussion, what actually is care work and system relevant work. Edna, I would like to start with the first question to you because the virus was called at the beginning the great equalizer. Everybody was talking about it, but now we see that it's definitely not an equalizer. Being in the home office is a privilege and the most unprotected are the ones who cannot stay at home, for example, and mostly our care workers. And this work is mostly done by women migrants. Could you please explain us a bit more about the inequality that the virus is showing us? So first of all, thank you so much, Carmen, uh, co-panelist, um, as well as um, the School for Resistance for organizing this event. And you're right to point out 
that um, social distancing is a privilege. And for those of us who have that privilege um, to be able to work from home, um, that's something to acknowledge. And one one kind of group of people I would also like to give gratitude for are the care workers and the essential workers who've been putting their lives on the line, especially those who are underpaid, um, undercompensated, and face very precarious situations. Um, and I guess I will um, give a brief kind of um, uh, gesture towards the, the, the care and what is so important about care. I think that it's absolutely ubiquitous in our society and it, it, face, it shapes how we survive and thrive in this world, even if it's not acknowledged. At the same time, it's part of um, various forms of rituals that allow us to not only heal and move through this world, um, but it also gives space for us to really reflect on excavating things like ancestral memories, um, being able to provide care for others on a, a, a kind of interpersonal level, but also um, having a, a collective, um, very participatory, participatory um, experience um, that allows for repair. Um, so um, I would say that care is very fundamental to, to how we move through the world, even when um, that world is in flux. So thank you for allowing us to be able to meditate on, on, on notions of care in this moment. Uh, to turn to your question about um, COVID-19 and this pandemic, I would I would say that last year was definitely a period in which people regained their interest in biology. Um, that is to say, now people know what mRNA is, genomes, like the, um, people are trying to understand uh, concepts such as herd immunity. And part of uh, why um, this moment matters is because uh, the, the social conditions of disease and its heaviness upon us has um, made us susceptible to um, trying to understand the dynamics of not just COVID-19 as a pandemic, but also other um, epidemics that have um, persisted and continue to persist like cholera, malaria, um, and so on. And one of the things that we are seeing as the disease mutates and changes, uh, we're also seeing how um, our so social structures and hierarchies are changing in the midst of this global pause. So the events of 2020 as they continue today um, has also enlivened scholars, writers, um, everyday people to reflect on the racial inequalities, the colonial inequalities and social discomforts that we're living through. Um, in one of the um, a New Yorker essay that Kiangi Amada Taylor wrote, she said, um, wrote, quote, this macabre roll call reflects the fact that African-Americans are more likely to have pre-existing health conditions that make the coronavirus particularly more deadly, end quote. And so this, this, this perpetual death or perennial death is something that is, um, that is, is obscured um, in some ways, but is ongoing in light of the racial violence that we've been witnessing, not just in the United States, but elsewhere. So even here in Germany, over the past several years, there have been um, far right uh, attacks in uh, Hala, Hana, uh, Hanau, as well as in Chemnitz. So um, the ongoing uh, pandemic ju ju juxtaposed with structural racism and police brutality um, has um, very much been part of perpetuating some of the um, medical inequalities. And, and part of what it, we can think about when we think about what it would look like to actually address um, the pandemic is to actually try to understand who are the most marginalized people in society, what are the structures that we need to address to um, be able to provide um, not just care in an abstract sense, but um, adequate compensation, um, ensuring that people have time off, um, ensuring that the resources and goods in the global north um, aren't just um, sitting there, but actually get distributed on a, a full level. But then also beyond that, the question around refugee and migration, where uh, for migrants who particularly are coming from North Africa, Western Asia, and the rest of the African continent, um, ensuring that they get amnesty, immediate amnesty uh, during this crisis, as opposed to um, the shutting of borders to them. Um, and as of course the ongoing climate crisis continues, um, dealing with that um, be, uh, is also gonna be part of uh, ensuring that the virus uh, doesn't disproportionately impact um, those who are facing um, massive drought in their home countries, et cetera. So um, 
if we think about the virus as one um, biological element, it's not the only element that um, is producing the inequality. If anything, it gets perpetuated uh, by the colonial, capitalistic, racist, and gendered uh, inequalities that we see so present um, in the world. Um, but it, it, what I would say is necessary to um, be able to remedy those, um, those social inequities is figuring out actual concrete policies um, that upend um, the many um, social political structures um, that oppress so many people of the world. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm curious to maybe hear later on some concrete ideas on that from you. Um, I want to stick a bit to the topic of inequality because there's another inequality that we're seeing in the moment um, in the international distribution of the hope giving vaccines um, that are developed. And Europe already secured itself a lion's part with exclusive and expensive contracts. And on top of that, the knowledge about the vaccines um, are protected by patents which belong to the pharma industry. And nearly all countries with pharmaceutical industry denied and refused to have a patent pool which would, would make the knowledge about it accessible to everyone and would allow as well a quicker and local uh, production and distribution of the vaccines. So I would like to ask to you, Anne, to um, please explain is the, the patent concept briefly and as well what holds us back in Europe to share our knowledge and what role in all of this the farmer will be actually plays. Thanks again for having uh, us tonight. Um, yeah, I start uh, in explaining the global patent system. In our opinion, this patent system is one of the biggest global obstacles to the, the supply of life-saving drugs to people. The patent system has focused knowledge production in health on profit maximization and capital gains rather than on research and development and equitable distribution of life-saving medicines. So this is a very general problem, not only a problem of this current pandemic. This patent system is based on the assumption that this could create an incentive for innovation because research into medicine will be refunded by high prices of medicine protected by the temporary monopolies that the patent system assures. In doing so, it does not meet global health needs. And the patent system ensures that even those drugs whose development is based on publicly funded research are sold at high prices. Innovations are being paid twice in this uh, logic, once through public funding of research and a second time to, uh, through these high prices. In my opinion, this is a very serious form of privatization. And it also conceals the fact that public financing of research and development would be more favorable from an economic point of view than refinancing it through patents and high prices. The central problem of the innovation through patents is that it triggers research only in area where profitable products are secure meaning that health problems of poor people are neglected, like malaria and others, uh, um, as they or their health systems cannot pay for the, for the medicines. During the last year, uh, the pharmaceutical industry receives billions of public funds for the research and production of the vaccine yet it is allowed to set the price of itself without any transparency and keep the research results protect, uh, protected by patents and other mechanisms of intellectual property rules, like the TRIPS agreement, some of you might know. That's why the vaccine is expensive. That's why the same countries that gave billions of the pharmaceutical 
the two the pharmaceutical companies have to provide now public funds again so that uh, the poor countries will eventually get some of the vaccine at a later stage. And what we can see from today, uh, from the today's perspective, uh, perspective is that um, many countries will wait for another one year or two years until they get the vaccine. This COVAX funding uh, model, um, some of you might have heard about it. This is connected to the WHO and is a kind of public-private partnership between pharmaceutical industry governments and the um, uh, and the um, uh, philanthropic-capitalistic um, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This model, for example, still lacks many billions to ensure supply of uh, vaccine doses. So we can see that the world and all of us pays the price for these profits. But it would be too easy to blame only the pharmaceutical industry alone for this situation. Politicians have failed to attach conditions to the allocation of public funds and this is now falling on our feet. And just to remember us, uh, back in 1999, so already 20 years ago, the World Health Assembly of the WHO called on its member states to critically ex examine the impact of international trade agreements on healthcare and their populations and to prioritize public health interests in matters of pharmaceutical and health policy. A stronger wording which ex uh, explicitly placed health above economic interest was prevented by massive pressure from the Western industrial countries. And this is the same that the situation we are facing now. So this global injustice is evident in the coronavirus pandemic and goes beyond it at the same time. It is particularly visible in places where people cannot afford essential medicines like uh, you mentioned already before. Despite rapid medical pro uh, progress and the availability of medicine for cure and treatment, millions of people die every year from diseases like tuberculosis, diabetes, or malaria. And the WHO estimates that one third of all patients worldwide do not have access to urgently uh, needed drugs due to high prices and other structural uh, obstacles. So the deadly um, force of this system is particularly hard for those who are marginalized in their origins and income. And these zones of exclusion, how you can call it, range from refugee camps, like we can see right now on the island of uh, Lesbos and the refugee camp of Moria and others, to urban slums all over the world and entire countries. So to uh, come to an end for this first question, incremental changes to this system, such as life-saving price reductions for HIV drugs, only came about a result of years and years of international public protest and thus had not, uh, to be forced by civil societies and countries particularly affected by the pandemic. The patent system itself also creates barriers to research progress by patenting research method and instruments. So overcoming these unjust structures is an anticipation, uh, anticipation of a future in which services of public interest are freed from the market and profit principle uh, and which places uh, the human right to health as a public good in the center of health policy. Definitely. And maybe I can uh, ask once more, like, for example, uh, you're, you're based now in Germany. Knowing all this, why is the German government not just saying, okay, we change it and it will be a public good? What What is the 
or the what is the government gaining by giving all this money, as you said, even twice to the pharma industry? Mm. Yeah, I think we will can we can deepen this debate later on in the in the in the next questions. Uh, but what I, what I can say is that there is a great fear that when the 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 huge issue of the patent system is um, is raised, that um, we will we will come very close to a debate about the capitalist system as such. So this is really one of the strong pillar of our system. And when there is the proof that it works quite well without the patent system, people will start uh, asking more questions about the whole uh, systematic problems we are facing right now. So in a way, it's really ridiculous and not understandable. And it costs a, a bunch of money but what you can see is that there is still a high priority to defend the system, the capitalist system we have, and to leave people behind to do so. Maybe we can stick uh, to this topic of capitalism, Edna, uh, because in one of your articles, you wrote, pandemics do not materialize in isolation. They are part and parcel of capitalism and colonization. Could you explain us the historical context of the interconnectedness of capitalism, colonization, and how in which way it influenced our public health system? Sure, um, but before I, I answer that, I guess I also want to dovetail to the previous comment about Germany and its relationships to um, thinking about distribution, especially as the head of the EU. I, I think one of the things that the Germany has to re reckon with is its um, history of colonialism and colonial violence, particularly on the African continent. So the question around historical amends um, and specifically um, the colonies that it had, uh, the Deutsch Sudwest Africa, which is present day Namibia and Deutsch Ost uh, Africa, uh, Burundi, present day Rwanda and Tanzania, and how um, the state acknowledges and makes amends for German scientists who appropriated um, not just um, objects, physical objects from that those lands, but also the, the bones, the skulls, and um, bodily parts of uh, these wet African people, and how some of those, those bodies, um, uh, remnants of those bodies, um, are here in Germany, in Berlin. Um, I think that thinking about the relationship of colonialism and how it set the stage for present-day capitalism um, has to be understood with what is going on today. And so, um, one major question that drives the work that I do and the works of so many uh, different scholars that I, I respect and honor is the extent to which racial capitalism and colonialism not only um, causes disease, but the extent to which it exacerbates disease. In um, Megan Bond's work, Curing Their Ills, um, she looks at that relationship, uh, the how colonial powers um, um, reproduced um, and constructed African illness um, by mostly focusing on the British context, but many of those dynamics uh, um, existed in the French context where for the French, medical encounters in present day Saint-Domingue or what used to be Saint-Domingue in present day Haiti um, was also um, dovetailed under a slave society with um, medical expeditions um, and other things. Uh, Algeria, there was um, uh, Richard Keller's work looks at the relationship between French um, occupation of Algeria and madness. Um, and then there's also Napoleon's expedition in Egypt and the ways that um, that was tied to spreading the plague. Um, and one could go on and on uh, with these encounters and these histories in which uh, epidemics um, spread, um, people were experimented upon. Um, and, and this is something that we have to, uh, especially as people who currently live in the global north have to reckon with what obligation, both moral and material, do we have um, to not just, of course, call out some of these inequalities, but to know them and call them by their name and to do something about it. Um, like as it currently stands, um, there's 1.2 billion people 
in the world who live on what the equivalent of one dollar a day or less. And yet, meanwhile, there's 200 billionaires who um, have doubled their wealth in the you know 20th century. Um, so this this inequality um, and this financial inequality is, uh, has to be redistributed if we want to solve some of the major um, social and inequalities that exist. But beyond that, there also, in my opinion, needs to be a, a reimagining of how um, the global South is often experimented upon. So in April, two French scientists um, suggested that there sh they should have conducted trials on um, African people uh, for uh, COVID-19. And it caused an uproar because it was it, it kind of alluded the sense that Africa could be a laboratory um, for Europeans um, uh, so as they develop the vaccine. Um, and it, in some ways is a mirror and a magnifying glass to previous situations um, and that, um, hierarchies that existed under French imperialism. Um, and it's also a, the kind of attitude that doesn't allow or gives the space um, for actual mutual cooperation um, in terms of uh, medical information, medical knowledge, indigenous knowledge, as opposed to uh, the, the types of experiments that in, in, were present during the 19th century. So, um, at, you know, in thinking about this and thinking about the relationship between um, uh, colonialism, capitalism, um, and the pandemic, um, it's also there and no, it's also important to know um, the dynamics in the U.S. where um, 360,000 Americans up until now have um, died and um, a disproportionate amount of Black and Latinx and Indigenous people have um, have felt that hardship. And at the same time, what that then means is it's not just the death that occurs and the people who mourn their death, but the millions of people who've lost their jobs um, and a portion of whom might not return to those jobs, um, the acute economic hardship that is um, is happening in the context of a lockdown and in, in a context also one week later, uh, an insurrection led by white supremacists um, in the US Capitol. And so thinking about this dynamics, um, it's, uh, it's important to note the hypocrisy that existed, for example, during the 2008 economic crisis where uh, banks were bailed out <laughs> like in the US. Um, in fact, uh, they were able to get about 4.5 trillion uh, dollars between 2007 and 2015. And yet when working class um, everyday Americans were begging basically for, for some kind of relief, there was a $1,200 check once in the spring, in the late spring. And then it wasn't until December that they decided um, at, as a legislator within Congress to give a $600 um, compensation. And for most people who have lost their homes, that's nowhere near enough. Um, and if you compare that to Germany, where um, there are people who did get like 5,000 uh, euro grants. Um, there's in in incentives for short um, Kurzarbeit or short work, I guess that's how you translate it. <laughs> um, and the, there's, there's some kind of social government relief. And so in many ways, the, the play out of how, um, uh, how governments have responded to the pandemic often reflects how the government already sees and views the population and the people who live on its land. Uh, so it's no accident <laughs> that the U.S., as chaotic as it is, um, and, and how polarized and neoliberal as it is, has really left as a government people to fend for themselves, uh, which is unfortunate. And the reason, at least in Germany, of course, the numbers aren't, um, there have been deaths here too, and we, um, Honor, we should be able to honor the lives that have been lost, but there's been incentives put into place because there's been workers' movements to create those social structures to allow the space for that safety network. Um, and I think this is a moment in which we should be trying to fight for not just um, social support and networks in one country, but on an international level um, and to make uh, uh, the governments that have, um, in some cases, caused havoc on their own citizens accountable um, to say, well, if the banks got bailed out, the people should be bailed out. Um, if um, And that in itself would actually allow for um, dealing with the inequities, dealing with the deaths that have occurred, and hopefully um, allowing us to collectively mourn and um, recover from this, you know, year of, of, um, of, of a pandemic. So I'll stop there. 
Thank you very much. I quickly, or because I just see that Catherine Rottenberg joined us, uh, I quickly want to welcome her here in the conversation. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I might just quickly introduce you to the other speakers and as well to our audience. Um, so Catherine is Associate Professor in the Department of American and Canadian Studies at the University of Nottingham. Her, and her most recent box include the Care Manifesto and the monograph, The Rise of Neoliberal Feminism. And thank you very much for spontaneously replacing Lynn Siegel, who is ill. So welcome. Thank you so much. So what have I missed? I'm sorry, I was coming from another meeting and um, here I am interrupting in the middle as Edna was so eloquently speaking. So um, maybe I can directly pose a question to you uh, because I already mentioned the CARE Manifesto and um, you're or in the CARE Manifesto, we were just talking about uh, capitalism and colonization. You state neoliberalism had neither an effective practice of nor a vocabulary for care. Neoliberalism is uncaring by design. Um, and right now in these days, we can see a lot of powerful business actors trying to promote themselves as caring for the people, as caring for the planet. Um, and we do see that some states pay uh, bonus to their care workers due to COVID. And we saw as well the videos, uh, the people clapping for the care workers and they went viral. But what can we do so that we don't get stuck in care washing one time actions? Uh, what are your proposals for a systemic change? Okay, so how much time do I have? <laughs> More or less five minutes. <laughs> five minutes to, to, to talk. Okay, so maybe what I'll do, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, maybe you outline very nicely. Thank you, Carmen, and thanks for everybody um, for being here tonight. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we discuss in the CARE Manifesto and the kinds of, um, sort of very broad, in very broad strokes, the kinds of um, solutions that we propose, the alternative to the carelessness that we see, uh, which has been exacerbated in so many ways by COVID. Um, and one of the things that we do argue is that in the wake of the pandemic, what we've been, what we've seen is that we need a radically new politics. And Edna was speaking, I mean, I didn't hear the, the beginning of the speech, but clearly what we need is a new politics that puts care front and center of life. And so what we are approaching the care manifesto is one that understands care as being necessary across all and every distinct scale of life. Um, and of course we do begin, as you mentioned, Carmen, uh, by diagnosing the ways in which the, the interconnected nature of the current reign of, of carelessness. And of course, central to our analysis is neoliberalism and uh, neoliberal capitalism. But in the manifesto we do, in order to provide an alternative, is we travel from the global dimensions that have produced the, the climate change, I mean, the climate crisis, and these economies across the globe that put profit over people. And then we move through careless states and communities um, to how the what we call the banality of carelessness affects our interpersonal intimacies. And then we travel outward um, and we scale up from the interpersonal to the planetary, planetary precisely in order to outline caring our alternatives to our contemporary condition of carelessness. And that, that's basically what you're asking. So what we posit sort of as an alternative is um, a caring world can only be built from the understanding that we are all dependent upon the systems and the networks, animate and inanimate that sustain life across I and mean, that's the basic um, premise of the care manifesto. And so building a care, a caring world begins first and foremost by recognizing that our survival and indeed our very thriving um, are everywhere and always contingent on others. Um, it first and foremost involves avowing our mutual interdependencies and embracing the inevitable ambivalences at the heart of care and caregiving. Um, so what we develop in the care manifesto is a notion of universal care and it calls for inventive forms of collective care at every single scale of life. As I mentioned, 
Universal care means ensuring that care is distributed in an egalitarian way. It's neither assumed to be unproductive or primarily and or primarily women's work, nor when paid carried out by mostly poor immigrant and women of color. Um, and so when we think about um, what if this means in terms of, and I'll, I'll give you just an example on the planet, which is the part, you know, the most uh, grandiose way of thinking about it. Um, but, but first, the, our vision translates into reimagining the limits from the interpersonal of familiar care to embrace more promiscuous models of kinship. It translates into, into reclaiming forms of genuinely collective and communal life. It means adopting alternatives to capitalist markets, reversing the marketization of care infrastructures, and restoring and invigorating and radically deepening our welfare states. And we have a whole section where we talk about what um, that we do not have nostalgia for the welfare state. We have to radically transform it. But some of the aspects of that uh, welfare state need to be uh, reinvigorated and expanded, of course. But if we think about the planet, and I don't know how much more time in terms of more concrete, um, sort of concrete uh, proposals that we lay out, how can we can cre create a more caring world, one that is capable of sustaining and nourishing all forms of life. Well, first and foremost, we know that it means rolling out the, a, green, a Green New Deal on a transnational level. Um, that And the Green New Deal involves, we know, transforming work patterns, both for the construction of green jobs and the production of the working week to produce emissions and expand our time and ability to care. Um, but of course, a transnational Green New Deal is not enough. We need an array of transnational institutions and agencies whose organizing principles are based on care and caretaking. And there are some examples that are emerging that, or that exist and have existed. Um, and we need these institutions to be um, premised on um, not predatory capitalism or financial imperialism or settler colonialism, but caring for the world entails remaking and democratizing all of these institu in international institutions and work network so that they facilitate this uh, the redistribution of the world's resources, enabling all states and populations within them to build the caring and sharing infrastructure that they need to thrive. So it requires cultivating and embracing what we call an everyday cosmopolitan conviviality, one that moves our, our caring imaginaries beyond our kinship structures, beyond our communities and nation states, the furthest reaches of the stra strangest parts of the planet. Um, that means that we have to cultivate cosmopolitan subjects who are literally citizens of the world, are convivial, have care for the world at the heart, at their heart, and recognize our irreducible differences as well as our profound interdependencies. And again, this brings us full circle, circle to one of the basic premises of the Care Manifesto, that it's only by valorizing rather than disavowing our global interdependencies that we can create any kind of care. So that was like, woo, but that's the best I can do. Five minutes after coming out of a day of meetings. Thank you very much. That already gave a very good insight in uh, what the CARE Manifesto um, brings more in detail. And I would like to stick to this question of how we imagine uh, specific new systems. And I would like to ask Anna, um, because as you already said, um, more than 3 million people are dying every year because of tuberculosis, because of malaria. And um, it seems that in the global north, these numbers, nobody knows them, nobody cares about them. And as well, the research um, about these diseases is not really enhanced because it's not profitable for the farmer industry, as these diseases are, play a minor role in the global north. So my question is, how do you imagine a global health care in which the global south does not depend anymore on the humanitarian gestures that you have described already before? And um, as well, what are you concretely demanding in regards to the patents kill petition that we have linked today as well? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I will answer it in a second, but I would like to refer just with one sentence to what Edna said before, because I would totally agree with, uh, with what, you, what, what you explained, Edna, in your last um, command. And in my point of view, this blockade policy of the industrialized nations that I mentioned 
and their insistence on these voluntary donation-based solutions are a form of neocolonial behavior. Poor countries are, uh, are uh, relegated to mechanisms that create dependency and widens inequality, as for example, also the South African delegation noted at the end of the WHO round, where they were discussing the question if there might be a so-called waiver in the TRIPS agreement that would allow to um, to uh, to um, aussetzen, to uh, leave the um, patent system aside for a while. So to come to your uh, question, this COVID-19 pandemic shows uh, the whole world that health policy is a global task and must be carried out by governments with a sense of responsibility and must be guided by a human rights principle and nothing else. This is also the key point of our international appeal patent skill that was mentioned before. So we should demand from our governments a policy oriented towards the health needs of the people which treat medicines as a global public good and limits the power of pharmaceutical companies in the public interest at the same time. To this end, the delinking of research costs and the price of medicines is, in our point of view, essential in order to create new incentive mechanisms that promote innovation and make it accessible. And to some of you, this might sound like um, utopia, but it is not, because just to give you one example, patents on um, uh, substances instead of production processes as before were introduced in Germany only in 1968. And also before there was um, research and development and innovations of new medicines. This example shows that patents are not the most important driver of medical process, and it is often claimed by the pharmaceutical industry and also by politicians, but rather ensure one thing all above it, uh, above all, sorry, and this is high prices. And if we take up the questions of our uh, debate today, what would a truly caring world look like? In my point of view, it is a fun of fundamental importance that health be thought as a human right, for example, that people have the right to best possible um, health care. This sounds also far away, but dependence on aid from rich countries leads to a feeling of powerlessness. And I think this is quite central also when we talk about care. In South Africa, for just to come back to South Africa for a second, this is the country most affected by the pandemic on the whole continent and the civil society, um, they, they um, came up with the idea of a so-called C19 coalition and they are campaigning for the removal, for example, the removal of patent protection um, as to counteract the mistrust. I can quote them for a second. They say in their uh, appeal that was just published yesterday, we support measures that seek to ensure that the WTO, so the World Trade Organization, rich countries and the pharmaceutical industry do not, in the pandemic, continue to enforce structural intellectual property rules patents and pricing barriers to undermine universal access to vaccines and thereby also limit mass immunization and in turn global herd immunity. Otherwise, they must account for the needless and preventable death in the pandemic. I think this is a very uh, important uh, quote. So we must insist on price regulation, control, and price transparency of all vaccines. So I stop here. So this was already uh, a concrete example of um, 
what could be done and uh, what should be done. And I want to pose this question as well to the other ones. And uh, Anna, please uh, feel welcome to add more there as well. If So my question is, could you please give us some examples of already working alternatives that show that our world can truly care, that uh, we can have as a, as a flag um, and continue working? Who would like to start of the two of you? Um, Catherine, I see you put it. No, I, I know it doesn't. I, I mean, I, this is one of the questions in the manifesto. We draw on historical examples of um, more caring alternatives to the present. But we also think about I mean, our, our whole spiel is basically that if we need to completely overhaul um, the current uh, system and in, or, and, and in order for this to be sustainable, uh, to have care front and center and have caring a caring world, caring communities, or even uh, this, you know, this bizarre thing, caring state, um, the priorities have to be completely transformed. But there are, we've seen moments in which we, where care has been front and center and in, this, in, the, in the manifesto, we talk about drawing on past examples, but also during the AIDS, cri the AIDS crisis in the US, the, mm -hmm. the kinds of organizations that uh, organized uh, around uh, caring for the sick. And um, as again, interestingly connected back to what happens when you have volunteer or, or grassroots organizations coming in and taking over what should be state or um, organ structurally organized uh, solutions. And I can talk a little bit about that later, but we can think about also the mutual aid groups, at least in the UK, that sprouted up in the wake of um, COVID as an example of the ways in which we have to have both bottom down, but also in the care management, we suggest um, top down, but not in the way, not hierarchical, but also coming from uh, different levels. Um, we talk about places like the City Plaza, squatters, a squatting hotel in the center of Athens. Um, and there are many examples, but there are, the, the problem is how then do we uh, scale up these examples? How do we make them um, sort of the, the norm rather than the exception? And how do we ensure that they don't come in in order to solve the kind or ba as band-aids to uh, solutions to the neglect and criminal neglect in so many countries and in so many communities. So um, one of the things that we, the challenge for us today in the midst of, uh, of COVID, right, which has really changed this, the, our, our, our common sense in particular ways, um, is how do we build on these earlier moments of radical change? And again, there are many more details, uh, dr examples in the, uh, in the CARE Manifesto. And how do we, build upon progressive visions of, let's say, even thinking about Rojava in, in, um, in the Middle East. Um, and how do we wrest back control from power grabbing one, the 1% and their tyranny of social carelessness? And I think what's interesting to think about, in, at least in the first few months of COVID and things are changing so rapidly, I don't know if you could continue to say this, but care for the vulnerable has been taken seriously by certain segments of the population across the globe. Um, but it will disappear, I think, being pessimistic, unless we start to build these more enduring and participatory infrastructures for care at all of these different levels. So um, we're we're grasping for specific examples that can help us. There are a lot in his in history, but the question is also how do we make them? Um, how do we learn from our from the things that didn't work in the past, and how do we make them sustain, sustainable and expand them in the future? Um, and so the care manifesto provide certain templates, but it's not prescriptive in that sense. Um, we're all in this together and we have to think together um, collaboratively about how to go forward. And uh, would you like to um, to add here and tell maybe some, some alternatives that you have worked on or that you know and you can share with us? So I would say that one of the many things that has um, been part of the kind of political uprising in this moment that is should be part of care work is also the question around abolition. Um, I think abolition should be centered not just towards the prison industrial complex, but abolishing wage discrimination, um, abolishing border systems, abolishing the, the very um, structures and foundations and pillars 
um, that have um, had uplifted racial capitalism, um, because in, in many ways, many of us who um, have to witness the specter of pain have to bear in our DNA, in our bodies, um, the, the racial capitalism, it leads to an exhaustion that um, realize, that many of us realize has to just be withered through abolition. At the same time, um, I've been very inspired, whether it's through my own participation or just witnessing from a distance um, thousands of kilometers away, the collective fight on the streets, um, the creative expression that people have, um, the ways in which people can utilize mutual aid from the bottom up um, to be able to care and redistribute resources within communities. Um, it also, um, for me, uh, is important to ask and think about more deeply uh, what repairs are conceivable, um, even when we have these systems of oppression still in place. How do we um, heal from the colonial wounds, the capitalistic wounds through um, collective practice and care? Um, and I agree that the univer implementing universal care as the care collective has um, um, put forth in their book is so important. And an example of, of that collective care that I saw, at least on a creative sense, here in Berlin, um, the Nian Binki Lab Collective, um, as well as We Are Born Free Radio, um, had an 11 day performance um, here in Berlin um, called Radical Mutations on the Ruins of the Rising Sun, where during the early fall, there was a production and a set of conversations and series in which people were invite to th invited to think about mutations, the changes that and social changes that they've been doing, thinking about their history um, through drag performance, through a radio program. Um, and one of the things that I noticed is upon seeing who was being able to be put on stage was that uh, of the 70 artists, musicians, dancers that were participated, um, majority, I would say 95% were Black, Indigenous, people of color. And to gather that many people in Berlin, many of whom are precarious and in some cases undocumented or documented, many people, who, some people who haven't necessarily migrated, but as people of color, they're perceived to be migrants. And part of why that was so important um, in the, the, you know, in the middle of the pandemic to celebrate and bring life to the talents of these um, artists is that so often in Germany, um, people of color are silenced and aren't always visible as the like typical idea of what Germanness might mean. And to come together uh, in a moment of alienation and isolation meant that we could challenge the colonial history, that we could challenge um, the idea that we're not here. In fact, if anything, having a stage um, at how meant that um, we could say and create our own archives through the um, We Are Born Free Radio um, uh, Sonic archives, but also it gave us an opportunity to see that you can gather um, while socially distant, of course, <laughs> during a pandemic um, and reimagine um, another future, reimagine a set of possibilities um, where one particular artist or dancer try to break the fourth wall through sound. Um, another artist um, uh, try to use comedy to be able to, in German, uh, um, speak to some of the uh, the various you know stereotypes about traditional mainstream German culture. And I, I think that for me, it was, it was so important not just to see something like this um, present, but to also, um, find that joy that we we want so much, so much from ourselves and to exercise that through a restorative and collective act of performance. And I, I think the contradiction of living in an epidemic under capitalism is that when we're presented so much with sickness and with death, um, we can we can um, um, absorb that in our in our bodies. But that is it's really um, through um, you know those creative acts that we can start to undo um, the visible images of destruction. And you know it's, it's in this way that um, I'm really inspired by uh, Audre Lorde's cancer journals, where she, as she was you know dealing with um, cancer documents, and, you know going from depression to this, this point in which she saw care as self-preservation. She saw care as um, affirming her joy, even if her body wasn't always feeling that. And, you know, she saw care through writing. Um, and so for me, the, the, the care work and trying to exercise that is um, the act of asserting one's joy. It's the act of asserting collective um, unity and gathering. It's the act of abolishing systems of oppression. 
And it's also um, the act of, of just being uh, able to express one's creativity in a world that may not always recognize it. And so um, it's in that, that way that I would say that I champion um, the creative works that have been um, coming from uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who've been doing that on a global scale in spite of um, the, the, the global you know, pandemic, in spite of racial violence, in spite of colonialism. We're here and we have power and we, all, we, we do have a creative voice. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's wonderful. Anna, um, I think you want to directly react on this. Mm. I just want to add uh, one, um, uh, another idea because you asked for alternatives and what should be done now. It only takes me a minute because I, I think we should open also to the audience then, but I, I try to, to, to uh, do it in speed. Um, so I think now um, is the time also for new ideas and one idea Medico is working on since quite a while is to create a kind of a global social contract in which richer countries commit themselves, for example, to pay for the health needs of poorer countries as long as they are unable to do so on their own. And this implementation of a kind of global health fund based on contributions that are binding under international no law and not on a voluntary basis, so far is failing because of the lack and will of part of those politically responsible people. And I think the time that now is a good moment to um, put pressure on these ideas. And this reflection goes far behind, uh, beyond the vaccine debate and looks at building universal healthcare systems. And it must also, uh, must also um, look at our way of life as such. And just to sum up, I, I am of the opinion that um, if we want to look forward to a summer without fear, and to look uh, beyond the pandemic situa situation we are facing right now, then everyone should be able to rejoice. We who have profited extremely from capitalist globalization in our way of life and have the money and the means, owe this to the world and also to humanity. And it might be sound a, maybe a little bit path uh, pathetic, but in fact, all should be able to enjoy a summer after Corona, no matter where they were born. Definitely. And as you said, I want to open for questions from the audience now. Um, and I think with your answer now, Anna, but as well with your Atlas, you already replied somehow to a question that we got a few times. And, uh, but before I come back to this, there's a very concrete question to Edna. If you could please repeat the journals that you just have mentioned. The journal or the, um, the yeah. particular 11-day uh, performance? Yes. So the 11-day so the performance that had happened here in Berlin was called Radical Mutations. Um, on the notes of the rising um, um, radical mutations um, uh, and on the ruins of the rising sun. And it was curated by um, three people who are part of the Niambingi Lab Collective. Uh, those people are Natalie um, uh, Aguizomo Ba Bekoro, Saskia Koshal, and Tim Nitzer. I can also put it in the chat if that helps. Um, and then the, the, the radio collective, We Are Born Free Radio, is a migrant and refugee led radio collective that's based here in Berlin, um, Germany. And they have wonderful programming um, that really tries to center migrant lives here in Europe. Thank you for clearing that out once more for our audience. Um, yes, a lot of people are asking via mail, via chats, um, really how can we avoid that after Corona, uh, everything or after COVID, everything will be the same as before. And you gave now, we had the, already the arts as one um, possibility to preserve what we are gaining now 
Uh, we have the petitions that you're calling for um, that are examples. And I know as well in the CARE manifesto, there are more very detailed examples of how we can really perceive what or take this possibility to make a real change. Um, of course, you're, you can add uh, more, I, but I do have another very concrete question for Edna. Um, so it is, how is racist thought connected uh, to the way modern medicine operates? You, Edna, as a historian, could you elaborate a bit how racism is connected to different diseases and sicknesses? So the first thing I would have to say is, as um, many historians of medicine that I know um, and historians that I know would argue is that race as a construct is not real and that's a biological construct. Um, that is to say, you know, there is one human race. However, um, racial identities as we understand them and how people move through the world as well as racism are very real. Um, unfortunately, um, when people see me, I am unambiguously perceived to be uh, Black, and there's wonderful things about being a Black person culturally, the history of resistance, beauty of like our culture, music, etc., and intellectual traditions from W.E.B. Du Bois uh, to Zora Neale Hurston. I'm, I'm proud of that. However, what that then means, though, despite um, all of those achievements, is that racism as a kind of um, process that is linked to the transatlantic slave trade as someone who is the descendant of slaves, who was born on indigenous land in what is often called the United States that off, that impacts um, uh, everything from life expectancy to the ability for doctors to perceive or understand um, so the pain that I may or may not be experiencing and to the point of um, uh, maternal mortality. So in the United States um, where I was born, um, the maternal mortality rate is worse today than it was 30 years ago um, the, for black women and black people with wombs. Um, the maternal mortality of black people with wombs is also uh, worse today um, than it is in the United States than it is in Kazakhstan. And so the that, that is not because of our internal biology, but rather how medical system treats us. It's what Harriet Washington often terms uh, racial apartheid. Um, and there's a history to that um, legacy that is tied to everything from um, the, the ability for people to access um, medical resources, the history of experimentation on people's wombs, um, the history of sterilization, the history of eugenics, um, and even just the present day, um, who can even afford to have health care and health insurance within the context, not just in the United States, but on a global scale, which um, has been um, pointed to earlier. And so when we think about um, that history, that legacy, and the current dynamic, part of what um, is, ne is needed, uh, I guess, as a, a kind of global dynamic is to try to undo that damage, to undo that work, to create anti-racist policies, um, to train medical practitioners um, uh, to uh, shed that unconscious or in some cases very conscious <laughs> bias towards uh, Black people, Indigenous people, etc. Um, and to really um, uh, collectively heal from those both internalized and um, and also just vivid uh, markers of racial discrimination in the healthcare system. Um, I would say that part of that will also mean being particularly care caring <laughs> towards and listening to um, um, people of color, Black people in particular, who've been the victims of um, health biases, racial biases, and then to also um, do like learn the history of that. So I'm I'm very uh, I, I I love the history of, of of people who've been able to highlight this. So like Dorothy Roberts, Killing the Black Body, who highlights that history of um, anti-black racism and massage noir in particular, a, a, a term coined by Moya Bailey, um, and Harriet Washington, who I mentioned, uh, Sadi Hartman's Wayward Lives also briefly mentions the work of Marion Sims, who experimented on black women in the 19th century without their consent. Um, and it goes on and on. Um, the work is there. Unfortunately, 
many people don't know about it uh, or in the mainstream <laughs> and um and not enough is being done to undo that damage so um again like racism as a con as a construct that we live that we see even if people might not think they're part of that system has to be examined has to actually be targeted towards the medical system and has to be something that is is approached with care um so that we listen to those who continue to be disproportionately impacted um by those inequities um i think i'll, I'll stop there Thank you. And I see as well that we are at the limit of our time, but I would like as the people are really um, asking and searching, it seems for a hope, giving another example uh, how to, to uh, keep care after COVID. I would like to ask um, if any one of you wants to give one last example, one hope giving one or um, anything else. Otherwise, after this last round, I would close our conversation. Can I just say a closing word and thank the participants and I apologize again for coming late. Um, I think that what comes out of all, everything that we've been saying, whether the focus is on uh, racism and the medical system or it, whether it's on um, the current COVID crisis, is that the only way in which we we can create an alternative society is if it's if the infrastructures are are in place, if they're resourced, if they're egalitarian, if there is not only an abol abolition of the systems of, of of oppression, but also rebuilding in a way in which care is front and center. And I think we're all speaking in, in different, you know, we're all focusing on different aspects of it, but ultimately what a caring society requires is the resources that are distributed egal equal, egalitarianly, I don't know, that's not a word. Um, and also that we have time, more time to do the kinds of caring work um, and the kind of creative caring work um, that needs to be done in a post COVID world. Um, and so that is, and if you look at what's happening within the dying em empire of the UK, right, not only is um, it not doing anything else for, you know, it's now England again, but it's devastating its own population, right? So that the numbers coming out and the, and the money that is, the public money is going to these corporations and five corporations are basically helping to determine, um, you know, US elections to what's happening in terms of distribution of, um, of medical goods. And I think that we have, we really have to rethink um, in the wake of COVID in particular, given uh, the context, how we go forward. And we, there, there is hope, we just have to create it. We can't try and find it. Um, before I uh, try to sum up some of the things that were discussed, um, from my point of view, I think it's also an option to contact all of us via email or Twitter or other uh, ways. And you can raise uh, your questions or add or comment on what we discussed now also at a later stage. So we should close it here. Um, and what I can add uh, is that I, I must admit that I'm not too optimistic when I take a look into the future. Uh, be, uh, but I think what we learned from this pandemic is that we are facing a polydemic that already started before Corona and will continue afterwards. And so what we can maybe learn is that we um, try to combine our different approaches and social struggles and movement into one because we are we saw the interlinkages between all those things happening because just to give a, la a last example um, it only took the blink of an eye for millions of people to lose their precarious jobs in for example asian textile factories because the large textile change that we know here around uh, from our shopping malls no longer collected their orders or did uh, even pay them. So you can, what we observed was the franchise situation of the whole system. And I think maybe we can also gain strength um, 
for, for, for the future social struggles, realizing how this is all linked to each other and that it was possible to, to stop the whole machine. You know, the planes uh, remained on the ground and this is something also Greta Thunberg raised that what we experienced a situation that was different and where everybody said, when we stop the whole machine, everything will break down. And so maybe we can also learn from this that, uh, that many um, solutions are really a, a question of a political will. And so it's worth to fight for it and to also to force uh, for a change. But it's a long way to go. And I think we shouldn't, I, I can't end in, uh, two optimistic uh, options, but we will keep on fighting. Well, I guess one thing that I would say in terms of optimism is that um, in on the 1st of January 1804, my ancestors were able to liberate themselves from slavery um, against the French Empire. And if they can do that, if they could, using the minimal resources that they had, um, I feel and I have to believe that um, more can be done to resist and um, really abolish the systems that have oppressed us. I think the ability to imagine that the with the breath that we have, with the, the people power that we have, can allow the space um, um, because we have the numbers um, and we have the resources. Um, it's just a question of, of willpower and optimism um, as we hope hopefully can collectively with care as everyone has noted um, to really do the work of changing this world so um, i hope that although it's, there are many reasons not to be optimistic um, for you know the sake of um, the communities that i'm part of i think it's important to to try yeah. and, and optimism is also created collectively exactly as edna said so that's mm -hmm. ties the two the different sides of optimism, hope together is that the only way that we can go forward is together. So uh, I am very optimistic after this conversation and I'm optimistic as well that we will all stay in touch and see how we can combine our uh, strengths to find a synergy and to actually give more power to all these movements that already exist. So all these good ideas that uh, need to be practiced now and that there has to be the pressure on our politicians uh, to change. And we are all voting. So we do have a voice and we can do much more than that. And with this, I want to thank you very warmly for being here tonight, for joining this conversation giving us an inside view on your perspective on care and on the work you're doing. And um, thanks to our audience for watching, for commenting, for asking questions to um, yeah, participate in this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.